Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to our webinar today, looking at enticing online audiences. I'm Linda Coburn, I'm the moderator for this session, so I'll be um, giving you a bit of setup, telling you what's going to happen, and, um, and then introducing our speakers, and away we'll go. Um, before we're anything else, there's a few practical things to note, which are that um, we record the webinar so that if anybody wants a copy of it afterwards, they can have that and it'll be available on our YouTube channel for a period after this, after today. Um, to say that we use uh, the chat function for um, questions to our panelists, discussion between you and popping in useful links. So that's really where, um, where you get to engage with the webinar, it, it, you use the chat, which you can find at the bottom of the screen. And thirdly, we have a live captioner, Jen with us today, who does an amazing job of following what everybody's saying. So if you would like to use the live captions, again, the, um, the link is at the bottom of the screen. And I think the information on how you can access live captions is also in the chat. So um, today we're really thinking about the ways in which you can make your content, your work as appetizing to people as possible in a busy online space. And um, obviously the webinar is brought to you by the space as an organization. So first of all, if you don't know us, I'll give you a little bit of an overview um, of, of who we are and what we do. And the slide explains it all really that we're the digital commissioning and development agency for the arts and cultural sector. And in essence, we support arts, culture and heritage to create digital content and experiences that entertain, inspire and educate audiences and visitors. That's really what this is all about today. So as well as the big part of the commissioning of work that we do, and you'll hear from two case studies of organisations who have been commissioned by the space. Um, we also run a whole uh, strand of work around sort of skills development and, and training for the sector. And this webinar is part of that. So really sort of learning the lessons from the wide range of projects that we've supported. Um, and so just to give you a feel for what's going to happen today, um, we're going to start with, uh, I'll introduce the, the panelists in a minute. So I'll ask them to put their cameras on. So just to say hello, so we'll hear, see everybody first up. Um, so John and Vicky and Sarah, if you want to put your cameras on. So S Sarah's going to give us a, a bit of an overview at the beginning. Hello, that's John waving away. And um, and we'll find where's Vicky. And Vicky's here as well. Excellent. So, so we'll hear from Sarah first. And um, she's kind of going to give some overarching principles, things that she's kind of collected, some key thoughts that she's collected from speaking from her colleagues, other associates with the space about what really makes the difference in making your um, offer really compelling in that in that digital space and then our two case studies are um, we'll hear from Vicky Amedame who is the artistic director of Upswing who's waved to you already so Vicky um, uh, started as a circus per, uh, performer really working in all kinds of circus and then she founded Upswing to bring new artists and experiences to the stage and to celebrate a diverse world and she'll be talking about the project Common Ground and um, John, John Slemensek Thorne is a filmmaker so he's an independent filmmaker runs his own studio and he's also very involved in Woven in Kirklees and is the filmmaker on their um, Growing Colour Together project which he'll be talking about and John also has a background in marketing which as we will also find out, is really useful in this context. So we'll hear from the two of them later. So I'll invite them to turn their cameras off again now so they can relax and enjoy the talk. And um, I'm going to ask Sarah, Sarah, have you got your mic on? Are you ready to? Yeah, okay. So um, we're sort of really gonna start with some of the sort of top thoughts really. Um, do you want to introduce yourself, Sarah, and tell us a bit about why, how the webinar came about? Yeah, so um, my name is Sarah. I am one of the associates uh, for the space. Um, so I have, uh, I've been executive producer across a number of projects, but I also specialize in distribution, um, which means that as well as feeding back on the projects, I am often pitching them. Um, and some of the most common feedback that we have uh, as a team and from people that we're pitching to 
is how the work can have um, as strong a narrative as possible. So the most important thing um, for, for us as commissioners is for these projects uh, to have as many people watching for as long as possible. Um, and I think we all feel quite strongly that keeping the narrative clear or contextualizing the work well uh, online just makes that um, much more likely. So uh, I think we just wanted a space to provide some top tips of the feedback that we typically give projects to give them the biggest chance of success. So uh, we'll talk about um, how to do that across the main body of work itself, uh, whether that's film, interactive project, um, the supporting assets, which are super important, and then how you're actually framing it with words, so your copy. Um, so we're gonna focus on the two short films today, but a lot of the general advice is the same for any project. So it doesn't matter what discipline you're coming from. Um, I work across a lot of interactive projects and I would say it's even more important to explain really clearly what the project is. Um, the biggest tip I would say, which we will come back to is the importance of uh, this sort of critical friend. And the reason I mention that is because we'll talk, um, a lot of the advice today has come from the uh, associates and the core space team um, who regularly feed back on projects or go in and work on the project. But I just thought it's important to mention that even if you don't have a space commission, um, it's still really important to find that person in your existing network. Um, so someone preferably impartial that you can get honest feedback from um, preferably without leading questions and just keep asking them, you know, what did you uh, take away from this? Was there anything that you didn't understand? Um, build that person into your process and listen to them and, and tweak. So you don't need, uh, you don't need like one of the execs to um, come in and feedback, but it, that's just a really important role to fill, I would say. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Um before you go on, Sarah, I wanted to point out that um, we haven't got a presentation, but we've done a kind of top tips. So we've got two slides which will come to a sort of summary of the key points that Sarah's made, and we'll, we'll, we'll show those at the end. So they will be so that might help with note taking for people who, who want to think about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're saying absolutely find a critical friend, somebody who'll give you honest feedback. And then we were going to really go into thinking about this idea of supporting assets. So not the work itself, but starting in what are the things that you need to make that are going to give you a good impact online? What kind of advice do you give people about that? Oh, so, yeah. So what a supporting asset is, is just like, um, yeah, it's a, it's a shorter snippet of like um, what the project is, um, you know, where you're going to find it. And then this is just what they are, what ones you're going to need, um, which ones are really important and what they should look like. So I'll just run the through. Um, so the supporting assets are a calling card to your work. They are usually the first thing that people will see when you're advertising um, your project, whatever that is. So it's really important that they stand out, uh, that they sell the experience and that they provide as much information about that experience um, as possible. I would say they're the most powerful tool you have, um, marketing tool and contextualization tool. So it's really important to, to get it right. Um, so you start with building that bank of content that's gonna help you tell the story. So as a minimum, I would say what you need is one excellent static, so still image and one trailer. The image is like, you know, people are scrolling uh, so fast online now. If you could pick one image that helps um, best tell the story of your work, what is that? That's the, the minimum. Um, yeah, and then uh, alongside that, and I would say this is essential, is your trailer. So when I was um, asking associates, you know, what would they advise? What's really, really important? Um, someone who specializes in a lot of the social media stuff said, uh, video is king and short video is king of king. So your trailer is the biggest storytelling asset. It needs to explain what your project is, why people should watch it, 
um, how people can watch it and then provide a sort of arc to the work itself. Um, and just getting into the sort of nitty gritty of how long it should be and everything, uh, you need to grab the viewer's attention within the first three seconds to stop them from scrolling. That is how brutal the online world is. So put like really powerful um, opening shot up front. Total length should be between 30 and 60 seconds, ideally. Um, our brilliant design associate says everything should be kept within uh, 60 seconds. When she's doing this, you know, she's really strict with it because it helps her be more decisive on what to keep in uh, and what to cut out uh, and just keep it really snappy. It might seem really, really short, but um, one of the examples that we'll see, the, the woven trailer is 45 seconds and you will see how much information is in there. And it's all like super engaging, what makes you want to watch the film. Um, and it, do, you know, it doesn't need to be like a three minute thing and it's all down to like a good script. Um, so in terms of how you tell that story and how you decide what to keep, um, it's one quick hack would be asking questions via text. Um, or adding sort of more descriptive text prompts that will get audiences thinking, um, but will save a lot of the equivalent time in actual footage. Um, and then another top tip there is when you are working with text, which I would advise is to keep the text as short as possible. So you can't just have like a really long um, text card explaining everything about uh, the project. Um, sort of rhetorical questions are quite good. It's also, I would say, um, important to bear in mind what's right for you as an artist or a company. So it's the equivalent of writing in a house style. Um, so I used to work for a theatre company. They performed in many different languages around the world. So it was really unlikely uh, that audiences would ever see the show in its native tongue. So for them, the trailer always needed to be about movement. It was finding the most uh, visceral moments of the play, um, tell the story with it, but intersperse that story um, with reviews actually that helped move the action along, um, but also you know, sold the benefits of the show. And I would say that's a really um, common approach actually to theatre trailers. And then just some quick things on the logistics for um, how you signpost. So the trailer also obviously needs to include where and how you can watch it. So it's important to put the call to action at the end of the trailer. This often gets missed off. This should ideally be a, a simple link to your website or YouTube channel. Um, so no like uh, complicated instructions. And then unless you've got the capacity to re-edit the trailer, don't include your release date because it's gonna give your trailer an expiration date and you won't be able to use it once the film is launched or it just, um, yeah, ages it unnecessarily. You can include the release dates in the accompanying copy instead, which obviously you can go back and edit. Um, and I would also add just because um, timing is always, as we said, quite tight, um, be really strict with credits. Credits is a really big thing in creative industries for good reason, but with the social assets, you've got such little time that unless those names are um, acting as a real calling card to the piece itself, I would say just be really, really selective um, and leave it for the main experience itself. Uh, and then in terms of other assets, if you've got, so those are the minimum, if you've got some more time uh, budget or you've got like a really long build up to the campaign and those just aren't gonna cut it, I would also add a teaser. So this is um, insight into what the work is. For example, if you had um, a new musical that you were promoting, this is where you'd put snippets of your songs. They're typically around 15 seconds um, and they can be used across sort of social media platforms uh, like Instagram stories, um, and just add a bit of like fun context to the work. And then lastly, I would say for the more complicated projects, so like new formats or branching narratives or immersive audio, 
I would encourage everybody to think about and explain a video. This is a longer video that explains what your project is, um, but also selling it. And these can be really creative as well. Um, so last year I worked on a branching narrative project where the creator used their seven-year-old daughter, um, which was also uh, the show's target audience to host this explainer video. So um, she, she got her daughter to sit down with an iPad and show everyone how to get started with the experience, how to play along. So it was super, super simple, but it was really engaging, um, broke something quite complicated down, but also it had that benefit of um, appealing to young audiences and their families, which is what they're gonna do. And I, I'm gonna pop that in the chat in a second. Um, and also your explainer video can double up uh, as a trailer if you have got limited resource. So another one, which I'm going to pop in the chat, um, it's another branching narrative experience. Uh, it's called A Moment of Madness. And it's um, it was designed for like a group experience. And they really wanted to get that across with their trailer slash explainer video. So a really simple tip is just show people playing the experience, sitting around the table with a glass of wine, because that's how it was designed to be played. So it's got everything a trailer should do, but they thought about this additional footage um, that provided a bit more context uh, as into like what the experience was and the ideal setting to play it in. I'm just gonna pop that in. I'm just gonna say that, so Angela's put the, um, Kat, who made What Will George Do, which is one of the projects you're talking about, Sarah, she, she talked at a previous webinar about um, making that, that branching narrative story. So Angela's put the link into the previous webinar in case you're interested in uh, that particular piece of work and finding out a bit more about it. Okay, so, and while Sarah's doing all that, really, you know, there's heaps of information in here. Um, and she's, obviously what's really important is great examples of where people have done it well and watching them and thinking about what works here how what can I what can I steal from from this and we will show both um the common ground and the growing color together trailers a little bit later on when we hear from Vicky and John so it'd be another opportunity to sort of look and think what what have they done that Sarah's that reflects the kind of key tips here how how, how have they been mapped out thank you um and so, so we talked. We've talked about supporting assets and that being, you know, the bare minimum, and then what you can do if you've got any extra space and time. Um, and then the other thing that you, you know, you said was really important was this idea of the supporting copy. How are you going to write about your project? What, what, what do you need? What kind of words do you use? How do you make those really enticing? Yeah. So the supporting copy, that's just like the text that's going to accompany your work or your trailer. And these are sort of top tips from um, our marketing associates who are always uh, working with companies to get the work out there and is in front of as many people as possible. So big thing is the um, tone of voice. Really think about it. So make sure your copy is as descriptive as possible. Yes but make sure you're also putting heart into it, like make it really personable and reflective of you as a company or artist. Um, and then some really practical things. The ideal title length is between 20 and 60 characters. Um, so longer than a, you know, couple of words, but no essays. And then even if this makes the, cup, the uh, copy feel abrupt, is important to front load the descriptions to make sure that all of your um, most important information is shown before the cutoff, which uh, most of the social media platforms will have. Um, and it's important to make the use of your YouTube end cards. Most projects are uploaded to YouTube. Um, these are the links on the end of the videos and the playlists that come up at the end of the video. They will keep people watching your content um, but they're also good for YouTube SEO. So if you're update, so if you're uploading your trailer, make sure you then put uh, the film on one of those end cards so it will kind of automatically play. Really simple but really effective. Um, and then once you have published 
your main piece of work, make sure you go back and update the trailer description to link directly to the main piece. Again, these are like really simple little things, um, but they drive a lot of um, prospective audiences to the piece. So yeah, just making sure everything's joined up. Lovely. Thank you very much. So we've talked about the kind of the, the, the stuff around the work and then finally we're kind of going back to where you started, which is the, the structuring and the storytelling of the work itself. Do you want to just give, give us your top thoughts on that? Yeah, so with this, the main thing is um, even though you've got the copy and you've got the supporting assets and most people realistically are going to have come to the work because of a recommendation or they've previously heard about it like in the press or through someone else, the best thing to do is treat the work as standalone. Just assume that um, nobody knows anything about it. This is the first time they're seeing the work and first time they're hearing about your company. So don't assume any prior knowledge, especially if one of your aims is to reach new audiences. So uh, in terms of how to do that, um, for contextualizing, the introduction is the most important bit. As I said earlier, you don't have long to make an impact. Uh, the online world, especially with things shown for free, is so fast paced that the introduction is kind of going to be make or break for whether um, people decide to invest more time in the project. So it's an opportunity to show off. So it might be um, beautiful aesthetics and it might be a way to make them laugh. So with the examples today, which we'll go into, with the mockumentary, um, it heads straight into the action of the film from the first second. There is a joke within the first 20 seconds. With the textile film, um, there's establishing or opening shots of the beautiful um, materials being created just before the narration comes in. So within seconds for both of these, you have this like beautiful showcase of what's to come to hook people in and give them a flavor of, um, of what they're in for. Another top tip, um, so I worked on two dance projects this year that they both had quite long um, opening sequences. Uh, so it was really important to have the title of the piece within the first few seconds. And those titles also needed to be thought about in terms of being engaging, but also descriptive, um, letting people know what kind of thing they're into, in for, and then uh, a well-timed strap line. So, really straightforward, a new dance film by da da da. And you set that uh, to some really striking footage so that you can hook people in, but also explain um, what it is they're gonna be watching. Um, so give them insight plus a reason to carry on watching. It's a little bit of a Ron Seal uh, approach, but it's very effective. And it's probably the thing that we say most to people. So, that opening uh, and the titles, that sets the scene and then you need to kind of carry on with the scene setting. That is done by using um, really strong establishing shots and audio of the people on screen and then allowing audiences to orientate in the place you're putting them in. Um, one way that you can speed this up is by using text cards or audio voiceover at the beginning of the piece to provide a bit more basic explanation um, and just do a bit of hand-holding um, to bring people in. So another project that I worked on, um, which is called Swim Club, it's about uh, a group of sea swimmers in Dorset. The pace of that film, it was really important to the team that the pace was actually very leisurely so they needed to provide that additional context up front as text um, set in front of the beautiful images of the beaches to help set the scene, um, but give some background into the film and what inspired it. And these two short text cards, you know, both one sentence each, probably saved about five minutes of footage, which you may find you don't have um, in the online world. If, if people are wondering still, like, what, you know, what am I watching? 
Um, another uh, sort of quick fix is to remind people who they are watching. So properly introducing your cast and their journeys, which is particularly important with um, documentaries because the people in the films are going to be really really familiar to you as uh, producers or filmmakers but obviously they're not going to be known to the audience so just make sure you are really giving them um, as good an introduction as possible and then remind people who they are you know like names on screens titles um, just don't assume that people know who they are and then I would say just lastly the the biggest thing for all of this is to create a really strong storyboard at the beginning of um, your project, but also for the supporting assets. Um, that's that's going to provide you with this sort of basis to go forward. Be really, really clear. What is at the core of your story? What are you trying to get across? What are you trying to achieve? And then as you go on with your edits, check in is it still achieving this and that is when um i think it's important to bring in the critical friend and ask them is this making sense to you and ask yourself does it tie into the aim that we made at the beginning and consult the storyboard so really really simple things but i think um yeah they're the most common bits of feedback that we give and if you make sure that you're doing all of those things the work um, should just be so much clearer to your new audiences. Thank you. I'm just I'm thinking we'll, we'll hear from John and Vicky about their processes and how they organise them and, and, and made their work later as well. So that would be great. Um, thank you, Sarah. If, if anybody's got any questions for Sarah, would you like to put them into chat? Um, there's one about software, but I think I'll come back to that a bit later on. So, um, when see if we've got different points of view. The, the question, well, I'll ask the question out loud, but not so much to Sarah, because I don't think it's necessarily her area of expertise, but to the audience in general, somebody saying, what software do you use to create a trailer? And I think that's one that ha might have many answers. So if anybody has any ideas, would you like to um, just reply to that in chat? That would be great. Um, um, we've got a couple of um, slides, which are summarizing the points that Sarah made. So we'll show the first one, which is, goes back to where she started from. So we'll just hold this for a few, um, uh, for a minute or so. So you can just have a look at it, make, take a screen grab if you want it. Just really key. And, uh, and then while well, we see whether any more questions come in. Okay, and then do you want to just flip to the next slide so we can see the other points? That one might need a bit longer to read as well. Sarah, was there anything that should have been on there that got, does that cover everything that you said? Yeah, yeah. I know there's, yeah, there's a lot there. Um, but yeah, no, that covers it. Okay, smashing. All right. Um, well, well, we'll leave that there for a little, a few more seconds. But I'm going to just uh, ask you a question, which is that when we started um, planning this webinar, we we were calling it "Context is King," which we didn't use for the title because it wasn't. We thought enticing online audiences was so much clearer as a title. But the idea was really quite exciting. You know, this is all about context. Do you really think the work that, that positioning your work is critical to its to its success? Yes. So I think that's with with like um, distribution hat on as well. It's like you need to make sure if, if you've got like a really strong vision for your piece, you know who you want to um, target with it and the message you're trying to get across. And so everything is in the framing of that so that you're getting um, as engaged an audience as possible. And that's everything from like where it's hosted, what partners you're gonna work with to how it's how it's described. It's, it's everything from, 
from that supporting copy to like tagging the thing um, so that it's getting in front of the right uh, online audiences. But um, yeah, and down to making the work itself, it's just helping people understand what they're watching from the minute um, they sort of set eyes on it. Yeah, yeah. And making the choice, choosing your piece over everything else that's out there. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And then, and then I also wondered, so supposing somebody follows your tips perfectly and makes this really amazing trailer and the trailer is actually better than the work. Is that a problem? You know, just, what if the work doesn't live up to the trailer? Um, I don't think that's a problem. I don't think that's a problem. I, um, I think if you have uh, brought as many people to the work as possible and then they decide that it's not for them, fair play. I, I think uh, the number one aim in the beginning is to, is to bring them to it. I think the important thing is not to mislead them. Um, so if you've made a trailer that is just so like uh, mind blowingly brilliant that um, people are gonna watch your thing and then decide it's not for them, that's great. If you are framing it in a way that actually isn't very representative of the work itself, I think that's when you have a problem. It's like, oh, that's not what I signed up for. So it's just making sure in terms of that arc um, for your supporting assets is the same. It's just, it's it's a little snapshot of what people can expect and like staying true to that vision. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we haven't got any other questions from the audience at the moment, and I'm going to get Vicky to join us now so we can uh, talk about common ground and show the trailer. Um, so, Sarah, we'll get you back on um, uh, later on when we kind of come to open up to a panel. So thank you ever so much for that. Right. So and, and then over to Vicky. So what we're going to do now is have um, just a, a five minute so Vicky can set up the project and, and what she was what they were aiming to do, what, what Upswing were intending to do with this work. Then we'll watch the trailer, then we'll do the same with John. Then we'll have a very short break because there's so much information in all of this. Then we'll come back for more, more of a conversation. So with all of that, Vicky, do you want to start by telling us a bit about this, about the, the Common Ground project, what you were aiming to do and who you were aiming it at? What was your thinking behind it? Yeah, so um, hello everyone. Um, Upswing is a contemporary circus company and we aim to tell new stories in extraordinary ways. And we're really about making work that's, that's playful and uncompromising and using circus, body, space and music and sometimes words to create something that's unexpected um, and new. And we've mostly been creating live work to date. Um, Common Ground uh, started off as uh, an idea for a live work, a new production that we're making in 2024. And it plays with ideas, uh, contemporary ideas around um, inclusion and around virtue signaling. The, the show itself will be uh, a staging of a new face of circus competition. And there's a role for an artist of color, but they can be only one. Um, and these artists are kind of forced to compete across disciplines, with nothing connecting them other than their diverse backgrounds, you know, and it's meant to be chaotic, playful, funny, uh, and tongue in cheek, and just kind of bringing our focus to the, the things that we find uncomfortable to unpack uh, and complex to unpack, but using comedy. Um, comedy and circus are both really popular forms. So that kind of coming to, together of those pieces, we're really interested in how we can reach new audiences beyond people who would be able to buy a ticket to come and see our, our shows. And we've been exploring working on film recently, but the, the forms of circus and comedy meeting each other felt like such a strong um, offer for, for, for making a film that, you know, when the space um, application came up, we thought, let's, let's go for it and let's see if we can turn this idea into a film. Um, very quickly, it, it was really, really clear that if we, we, we weren't trying to make a filmed version of the show or um, a, a short version of the show for the camera, that it, it needed to be something in of itself because the medium of film is very, very different from live performance. And fortunately, 
I was working with uh, a brilliant collaborator, Athena Cablanu and Dan Martin, a filmmaker um, who, you know, are both kind of, you know, Athena is well versed in, in writing for, for television. So we came up with the idea of kind of reframing it as, as an audition that these artists are invited to, to compete, to um, become part of the show and kind of use the structure of the film to follow a similar narrative arc to the show that we're, we're going to be making, but to, to focus on like creating a, a product that would be whole and in of itself that people could enjoy, um, you know, without having to buy a ticket to see the show. Mm. Lovely, thank you. That's a really good introduction. So, so what we're going to show in a minute is the trailer because the the film itself is about is it ten, 12 it's ten minutes? minutes. No, yeah. it's twelve minutes. It's ten minutes. Ten minutes exactly. So we'll put the the link to that and also to the the more of the information about um, upswing and common ground, so people can get in the context from it. So we'll show the trailer. But in a way, so you've made um, you you in the long term. There's the the live work which will be yeah. next year. The film, is, what you've talked about is rather than saying, oh, let's make a long trailer for the live work. We're making a piece of work, which is the film. And then there's a trailer for that piece, piece exactly. of work. So, so it's all ties together. So this is the mockumentary that Sarah, that Sarah was talking about. So Risha, can you, um, will you, so will you play the trailer for us now? Thank you. So we just take it. They normally cost more than one black performer. Did you do realize they're not that similar? Ooh, ooh, Group dynamics in something to get used to. Do I think I'm gonna get the part? They need me. Great, thank you. Um, what what do you think when you watch it again? Um, I, you know, I'm just always in awe of the the brilliant artists that that we get to work with, and how you know we we're not working with with actors, we're working with circus artists, but how they kind of really jumped into it uh, and brought all of the energy to the piece. It's 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 a really good fun film. And of course, there's a familiar face in there as well, isn't there? Yes, yes, <laughs> there is. Film. Great, thank you so much. So that's a lovely introduction. Um, we'll talk much more about the kind of processes and thinking about it and actually the outcomes and what what um, the upshot of, of doing that has been um, after the break. So I'm just going to bring John in now. So you, if you, you can either stay with us or turn your camera off, whichever's more comfortable for you just for the next few minutes. And I, I'm going to get do the same thing with John. So we'll set up. Um, growing colour together so we, then we know what the, the two um, examples are that we're working with so just same same to you John did you want to just give us an, an overview to the project and what your purpose was and who you were aiming it at of course Linda thank you very much and I must say I've been really enjoying this session myself it's been amazing like and, and it is from a, a genuine perspective this is really valuable information that we implemented throughout but actually I'm getting excited for my next trailer <laughs> already <laughs> but um, I guess to to kind of give a little bit of an insight into i am an independent filmmaker who works very much like very closely as the filmmaker and photographer for woven in kirkley's woven in kirkley's is a kirkley's based initiative that is very much looking at innovation within textiles that is from an a kind of an industry kind of perspective but also from a very community ground up perspective so the key for us is about really trying to marry kind of how the textile industry can kind of all work together from an individual consumer buyer maker through to then massive industry kind of and particularly in Kirklees we have world leading specialists who are delivering kind of like massive textile kind of initiatives that like impact the world. A large conversation at the moment is around sustainability within textiles. Textiles is in a very problematic area for kind of the amount of textile waste and some of the processes are very damaging to the environment and we were looking at how we can in a very positive way 
like open out conversation around how an individual can c connect with industry to be able to actually feel not just kind of lost in this sea of oh my goodness this kind of like the apathy that can sometimes be caused by these great kind of like issues that we are facing with the environment this was very much about how do we give power to to an individual to be able to to both be involved and be part of a conversation that might then lead to change so this led us on to natural natural color dyeing so for anyone who's not familiar with that that is a process of looking at natural dyeing process so we this is often using kind of plant-based materials that can then create natural dyes that are kind of different to synthetic dyes which are more artificially created natural dyeing really stood out to us because the beauty of it is the social engagement and the, the connectivity and the communities that can be harbored around it so woven has been implementing over a number of years a series of natural dye gardens across Kirklees. our aim is to turn Kirklees into a giant dye garden where that can be something from you can have a little kind of plant pot on your kind of on your windowsill through to then maybe a shared community garden which we've seen within some of our library services happening. The beauty of it is this, this becomes a catalyst for a conversation that could otherwise sometimes feel overwhelming. And the key for us and where it comes around to the film was we wanted to marry up massive industry experts, kind of brilliant minds, people who are working like to not just push textiles, but actually the industry is very much evaluating the environmental conversation but also then marry that with the the day-to-day -day artist or individual who might be getting involved in textiles even on just a beginner's way through to then a more advanced way so we found the the cat like the catalyst for being able to start really nourishing really interesting conversations about how we can action change was through these dye gardens and through people growing an understanding literally growing <laughs> an understanding of if this is the process I need to dye a piece of material, then suddenly you understand a little bit more of an insight into the wider industry. And it might lead to you as a consumer valuing that item of clothing that you have dyed and redyed, and it enters into conversations around circular economy, reuse kind of, and then sustainability from instead of throwing away that old t shirt that I kind of thought that scene, it's time. What if we re dye it? And suddenly it becomes not just an item that, from an aesthetic point of view, is beautiful and wanting to be worn, but it can hold memories depending on what plant materials you've used or the process, really. So that was where we wanted this film to enter people in, if, if that makes sense. It does make sense. So, so again, in, in the same way, Vicky's sort of given us an explanation of the kind of the timeline in that the, the, the production, the live production will be next year then, so they're making a film that is a work of itself. How, so you've got the, the, the Woven in Kirklees Festival, which is starting at the weekend, isn't it? Yes, that's correct, um, yes. But, so Growing Colour Together is part, is, is a theme within the festival and this particular, so the, the film that you've made is kind of standalone, but it's also part, connects to the festival. Absolutely, so the key for us was, we utilize film quite often in our in our um in our general sort of working but we wanted to really push our ambitions with this and tell a, a story that could really reach new audiences engage those who might have had nothing to do with natural dying before through to those who actually might be quite advanced and we wanted to embed that within our wider resources so we've actually been working on natural dyeing processes for a couple of years now we sort of led it from our our last festival that took place in two years ago and our festivals are almost like every two years we have this big celebration and this kind of coming together but actually we're running initiatives day in and day out so we're almost as busy in between the festivals as we are during them so the important thing for this film was to sit amongst that and to to inspire people whatever stage of their journey they might be whether that is completely new through to like I said a bit more advanced being able to jump in on the conversation and maybe get their hands stuck in really lovely thank you very much so I'm just, I'm, I'm just we're going to show the trailer and then after that we'll have a little break and give people time to digest and then i'll bring you back in so so it really a, di a completely different experience to to the the mockumentary style as you will see in a minute when we when we put the trailer on
natural dyed textiles are so important but also so nourishing for the people not only that consume them but the people that make them as well. It is really important to reconsider the way that things are made. The dye garden is everyone's garden. It's just about having a go. Dye gardens play an important part in connecting us with textiles. Lovely, thank you. So great, so we've had two very different examples to look at. So at this point, we're going to take um, a five minute screen break so you can grab a cup of tea to give um, our panel and our captioner a short rest and I rest and we will be back at um, just, just after 12, it'll be 12, one or two minutes past 12 by the time we come back. So look forward to seeing you again there. Okay, so I'm going to um, invite Vicky and John to rejoin us and we're going to delve into some of the ways that they worked and, and the work that they created and sort of really reflect on the points that Sarah made at the beginning, thinking about the work itself and tone and authenticity and all of that and thinking about supporting assets and how you reach an audience as well. So um, Vicky, do you want to, un you'll unmute and John, I'll call you back. You might want to, you need to put your camera on and... Here we are, here we go. Lovely, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so just to, and to say as well, as Vicky was explaining about being in, um, in a rehearsal space. So there may be people wandering about, or if we're really lucky, maybe perhaps trapezing past or something. I don't know. Uh, I've got, hang on, I've got actually some of the cast members who were in the, um, in the film. <laughs> so they might stick their heads in and say hello. Okay, so, so let's, let's start with you, Vicky. We, um, you know, but both of these projects, we, 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 po we chose them as case studies because they're fantastically successful of, of saying something about you as companies. And, and, and we wanted to kind of dig into some of the storytelling decisions you made. I mean, how did you how did you get the kind of authenticity and the tone of your work? What, what was some of the thought or the thinking behind that? I think the, 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 there were a series of kind of uh, decisions that we made that were probably slightly different from um, what we thought that we were going to do. So we always knew that we wanted to make something that would be uh, a standalone experience. And it took us a while to kind of come to the frame of shifting it from trying to restage a, a competition in the rehearsal room to actually using what we had in the space, which was, you know, there, there are inherent ways that competition is set up within our industry and an audition set up makes the most sense. Um, when we originally thought about the film, we'd had lots of conversations with people saying, oh, you can't get anyone to watch anything longer than three to five minutes. It needs to be a short film and you need to think short nuggets. And we thought we've got a lot to talk about. So maybe let's make a series of short films. Um, and very quickly that, that you know, we realised that we were trying to compromise what we wanted to do as a piece of work to kind of fit a frame. Um, and it was really great kind of having Natalie there as a, 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 an external prov prov provocateur to go, if you want to make a longer film, just make a longer film, but just make it really good and really engaging, you know, and do those things like how do you um, open the film in a way that people immediately understand what it is and, and what they're watching and you don't have to uh, do a lot of exposition or explaining to, to set the context what is it that you can use that will immediately give people a window in and they can land and they, they can um, follow your through line um, so explain to people to understand don't know Natalie so she's one of the producers at the space and so she effectively was your critical friend in that yes sense, and really probing at what you were doing and really helping you to consider your decisions yeah, yeah. So please continue please no, so, um, you know, as soon as we uh, thought about making a longer film, that kind of um, meant that we had to really, really, as you said before, think about how we tightly storyboarded it so that we could look at how we were making sure that we were keeping the energy up all the way through the film, because uh, the film follows a similar structure to what we plan um, the show will be. It was really important for us that people would watch all the way through to kind of... Um, land the idea but 
we needed to make sure that there were kind of little gifts all the way through the the, the film that kept them engaged until um, you know there's a, a turning point in the middle of the film that we shift from the the provocation of uh, being in this uncomfortable difficult situation and the the the, um, the humor and the social commentary that emerges from that to presenting people with a more optimistic vision where the circus really kind of got to live and breathe and kind of um, show the potential of what happens when bodies collaborate together and, and work fluidly together. So it's when you the way you're describing it, it sounds so much like you you kind of all the things that you think about in all of your work you've applied that to filmmaking as well, which is giving you this that sort of tone and the authenticity that, that Sarah spoke about. Yeah, no, I mean I I've we we've always made work for the stage live work, and it surprised me kind of how many transferable skills they were like. Uh, exactly as you say, thinking about how you build an arc, how you hold people's interest, how you focus people's attention. It's just that the tools that we were using to do that were, were, were different, like having a camera, um, being able to frame things really, really tightly, being able to pull out and direct uh, uh, an audience member's eye and attention in a way that's slightly harder to do on stage. Um, you know, it, it was it was really exciting to, to to have those tools to work with to kind of um, really dig into the ideas that we'd be exploring on the stage later, but in a different medium and in lots of ways reinforce our excitement and understanding of what we want to make for the stage further down the line. Yes. And I'll come back later to ask you about the kind of the processes of it and how it all ties together. But I'm just going to ask John if he's um, around. Yeah. Well, sort of same, same to you, you know, really thinking about the going back to Sarah's points about the, the story and setting it all up and getting, you know, the way you sort of frame your story. What were, what were some of the things that you thought about which story you were going to tell? Because obviously there's so, as you said, it's such a huge subject. How did you decide what's going to really entice audiences? Well, this was a massive challenge we had, Linda, was we are entering into this huge industry that is been around for centuries and natural dyeing has been around for centuries so it was about trying to burrow into individual portraits and trying to really unpick kind of associable stories that could speak about and reference the wider whole natalie woman the producer was really helpful in helping us kind of really unpick when we were accidentally creating a new narrative and going off into new topics because like said, and as I'm sure you, you heard from my explanation, there's so much to talk about in this. And we were having to try and really keep very focused to to kind of the the message that we were trying to, to, to give across around community engagement with this process. And a really important thing, which was very, very exciting to hear actually, was because a lot of the films I do make are shorter form. They're quite quick. It's about trying to to pull as much information into it as possible. Natalie actually encouraged me to slow down, to give space, to world build, to allow pe to allow thorough introductions of your characters, to allow people to have their space rather than jump, jump, jump to try and hammer a message across. That was a huge kind of, wow, this is really important actually is, and Vicky was completely right in you get, you get these numbers of thinking, I have to go as fast as possible or I have to make it as short as possible. The key for successful film for all of you, in my opinion, is about tapping into what you're passionate about and letting that drive the reasoning of what you're doing. And that was what I, I believe Natalie's support as a producer really helped was to unpick what we're trying to really achieve through this film and the stories we want to tell and being able to give them the space to breathe and allowing them the space and validating the time it takes to do that. Mm -hmm. And, and what about, you know, so some, some of Sarah's points about the, making a trailer, did you, when you heard what she was saying, did that fit with how you approached making the trailer for the film? I totally did. And actually, funnily enough, the trailers are more in my, my comfort zone, kind of, it's what I do a lot of. So I really felt kind of like I was flying with that, but like it still took a bit of, a really strong bit of honing. But what is lovely with a trailer is it's a chance for a celebration to really pick out your key successes the things you're really proud of the key points that you think oh that's really interesting or that might turn heads or get people to question more so actually if you once you get past the idea that oh my gosh i've got to make a trailer and this is like almost like an admin task it's not actually it can be a really lovely opportunity to just 
give these little pops and highlights. So certainly everything that Sarah was saying, I was just nodding my head throughout because it just is really, really key kind of points that were being made there. Is there anything that you want to add, Vicky? I can see you nodding away. No, just kind of echoing, um, echoing everything that's being said. You know, it's it's really interesting, like um, the idea of everything being about storytelling and contextualizing and, and framing. So the the choice of shots that we chose for the trailer, even though they were flash cuts, we thought about the arc of that cut so that would take people through the experience of. Um, what they might expect uh, for the film. And also importantly to set question um, that could only be answered by watching the film. Yes, yes. So like a bit of an intriguer to get people to think, oh, I want to see that. Yeah. And uh, this is Raf in the background. You would have seen him in the film. Hello, Raf. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, if I might add as well, I think something really important to remember is we sometimes get into this mindset that this film has to be for everyone. And actually that's a very prob problematic audience base to have is the idea of everyone. Of course, you want it to be open and accessible for all people, but actually we were really being aware that we are targeting those who might be a little bit more interested in, whether it's outdoor living or textiles or creative arts, and then utilizing a community led marketing approach alongside we, with the space, we had some brilliant marketing associates alongside then some marketing experts we brought in. So we married that up with a very community based approach of getting this in front of people who we knew would support it and then allowing it to kind of bleed out from there. So that took away that fear of us making it feel like something we wanted to make and it being within the realm of our interest, because we knew if we put it in front of those who are our community and our supporters, they can help push it out there a bit and it's never ever going to be a hundred percent of people will entirely watch this but if you can make an impact in our opinion with those that kind of are within your your bed and there may be interest people who are on the peripheries of that then that's entering into huge successes for us um john, john can i sort of carry on with that point because you um, you know, you said to me before, you were really sort of confident in the organic reach that your existing community and how they would support you. But you also did quite a lot of work, as Sarah talked about, in creating um, supporting assets. Yeah. Talked about doing Instagram lives. And you also said you created a huge number of screen set, screen captures. Do you want to just say something about that? Sort of, I think because what Sarah was saying was there's a bare minimum. And then if you've got some time, you can make some extra stuff. So what were the what were the things that you did that really supported your your film and your trailer absolutely so we were very fortunate in we were working with such beautiful kind of content a lot of the time like kind of that from the dye garden through to the textiles i ended up going through the film and capturing screenshots and ended up with a hundred hundred screenshots but actually that turned into a massive asset base for us to use across our marketing and then it was just about picking it down that we we had a number of voices speaking within our our film so that was like from like really like large scale dye experts through to then environmental experts and through to, to kind of, like I said, the more day-to-day -day artist or like participants. So it was about trying to unpick, well, what would they be interested in or what tools can we give to them to help them market it out? So we've worked with a lot of the people within our, our, um, our film to give them the tools they needed. So if they were like, well, actually I need a few images about the dyeing process, I'd be like, great, here is a collection here. And building things like we we created a blog where it was written from not just the perspective of the film, but me as a filmmaker and how we approach that to then try and attract those who are more interested in that behind the scenes, kind of how you make that. We did Instagram Lives working with kind of our brilliant sort of marketing team, which just gave another chance for us to spotlight the artists who were involved in the film and gave then a deeper dive into because I had to like edit. I ended up like with hundreds of hours of brilliant interviews kind of, and we had to cut so many people and it was quite almost mortifying. So actually the lovely thing that we could do and that actually gave me strength when I was making the most brutal cuts was going, well, what if I edit a little extra three minute film about this artist? And so we ended up with this bed of extra films and materials that then for me as the, the editor, I was kind of like, oh, thank goodness that got used in another capacity, kind of, which it is tough cutting that. That is the hardest job you will face as 
in creating this is you will have so much wonderful stuff and you have to unfortunately get rid of so much of it and and but that is, there is an opportunity in your wider marketing to be able to disseminate that still and utilize that that great material so for us it was extra videos reels photography blogs and just enjoying what that could lead to lovely thank you and vicky you made different versions of your trailer didn't you think you've got the sort of 45 second and then the 15 second yeah no we did that but i'm just kind of echoing something that john said earlier you know i absolutely believe that not everything is for everyone and that the more specific or the, the clearer idea you can have about who you want to talk to i think the easier it is to to create those assets and, and those materials you know and we knew that you know circus and comedy are, are very very popular forms they have a broad appeal but um we also knew that we were talking about things that you know not everybody wants to have a conversation about it's kind of quite um i guess socially engaged and on the front foot about something that could be uncomfortable comedy helps ameliorate that but we wanted to make sure that in in all the materials that we were putting out people had a clear idea of the experience that that we were offering um and uh, in terms of making those trailers, kind of thinking about the, the type of people that were likely to be interested in what we were making, where they were likely to be hanging out and to make assets that would sit in those spaces. So we had the 45 second trailer that would go on YouTube, on social media like Facebook. Um, but we also knew that a lot of our audience are going to be hanging around on Instagram. So to have something that could be a 15 second snippet that would sit on Instagram and work better in Instagram and, and TikTok and those spaces was really important as well. I'm, I'm interested in what you're saying about, um, you know, giving people a clear idea of what they're expecting. And I know that, you know, um, when we talked before, you were, you were explaining to me about the, the kind of some of this coming from the, the context being about the death of George Floyd and, the, and sort of sending an increase in, in virtue signaling. So yeah. I'm assuming that what you're saying, well, what I'm hearing is that you're letting people know that for someone like me, this might be an uncomfortable watch because it makes me question how I work. And well, I mean, I guess, it's, so how do you use, how, what kind of language do you use to I think know what's coming up in a way that still makes the work have impact. I think, um, well, I, I, I wouldn't like to assume what everybody's experience of, of that conversation would be, but I think it, it was important to let people know that this is what we're going to be talking about and we're not going to be soft about it. We're going to be provocative, we're going to be funny, but this is what we're talking about. Um, so that coming into that space, you know, there isn't a surprise. Oh, I, I thought this was going to be a, a circus piece where um, it was going to be fairly innocuous and, you know, nothing um, significant was going to be said. So to be led by the story, the, the ideas and, and the points that we wanted to hit um, in the trailer, as well as giving a sense of the visceral nature of the experience of physicality, but also that we're not taking it too seriously. We're talking about serious things, but we're holding them really, really lightly. That was what we were trying to achieve in that um, trailer mix. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and I can see that John's nodding away. Um, so just, so how successful were you? So I'm really interested because we, so how, have you met your expectations with the, the trailer and the film? Uh, well, should I lead on that, that yeah, Vicky yeah. then? <laughs> Give yeah. you a little pause for a second. Um, yeah, to be honest, we were so, so happy with kind of, we are very aware that in many ways, kind of what we were talking about could be potentially quite niche as well as like, um, as well as what we hoped it could be quite a universal thing. But our key thing was to connect in with our, our local community bed for, uh, first and then to start kind of wider conversations. But I was just pulling up the kind of the stats here that we, on our kind of on YouTube for the main film, we ended up achieving 26,000 views. Uh, the trailer got 43,000. And then on Facebook, uh, the main film got 41.1 thousand. And then the uh, the trailer got just short of a thousand. I'm very aware that like kind of these numbers can be great, but also they're not necessarily an indicator of pure success if you're not then getting kind of key conversations and actions behind it but at, so we 
we really wanted to make sure that we were embedding the film into kind of our events, into kind of all of our talks, kind of any opportunity that we could, because it's about, we would rather kind of like engage a hundred people really successfully than say we've kind of had tens of thousands of people who have not really engaged with our material. So I do, I do advise that it isn't about just high numbers. Those were wonderful. And we were seeing beautiful comments, really interesting shares. And so that was indicating it wasn't just like numbers that weren't having participation and engagement. So that for us was key as well. And trying to support there to be those, uh, those comments, that sharing, supporting that online audience, treating that online audience as much as you would if you had an audience in a room who were all there kind of being a welcome host to those and not just letting them become these invisible numbers. So yes, those, those numbers were fantastic, but equally when we have showings when we've got a kind of a, a network group or a, a grand color together meeting are just as valuable to us because we have a wonderful film thanks to our kind of working with the space and we're so proud of it and want to share it widely so yeah the successes were in the material we made and we're so pleased with then the audience that has followed and it certainly has been off the back of things like creating a successful trailer and versing that and getting those materials to help lead people into watching it as best as possible. Thank you, thank you. And Vicky, I'm gonna ask you the same question and then I'm gonna to say to the audience, if you've got questions for Vicky or John or both of them, would you like to pop them into chat? So, um, and again, uh, Common Ground has been, the, the, the film and the trailer have been very successful for you. What, what, how, how do you feel Vicky about the kind of reactions you've had and the, the it's, it's, it's been It's been incredible, um, so, we set what we felt were quite ambitious targets uh, with, with the space team uh, looking at 8,000 uh, views across the project um, uh, of different, we have different figures for the, the trailer and for the, um, for the, the film. Um, and we've exceeded all of those, you know, the, already the trailer has had over 10,000 views and rising, the film has had almost 20,000 views. And the, the brilliant thing is kind of looking at the data, most people are watching consistently through the end. We've got kind of a really good, higher than average rate of people watching through to the end, which for us tells us that the narrative is, is keeping people there, which is, is the real win for, for me as an artist and, and, and a maker, not just the numbers, but the fact that people are watching through. So that's really key. It's, it's won a, a, an International Circus Festival Award, which was also brilliant to be kind of recognized within the circus community and had lots and lots of kind of positive uh, feedback. And I think um, what's really interesting for us is the kind of looking at the, the spread of engagement starting to understand uh, a bit more about um, who is interested in our work and the things that we're talking about. You know, we, we knew that it was likely to be of interest to people who were um, uh, interested in circus and dance and, and movement work, people who uh, are interested in comedy, particularly provocative comedy. Um, so being able to do some work around kind of capturing some feedback, we, we did a little competition to ask people to respond to a, a survey that was attached to the video and got uh, loads of responses there and loads of information about our audiences, who's engaging with our work and who, and, and what they're taking away from it, which has been so valuable. So it's been a real success. Brilliant, so lots and lots of learnings, which is that's kind of the, I'm gonna lead me to my next question really, which is about, you know, and perhaps if you'll carry on Vicky and then I'll bring John back in, or you might just want to jump in John, but. So thinking about what did you learn from this whole process of making the trailer, making the film and all the work that you've done around it? What are your sort of key, key takeaways, I suppose? I think, oh, I'm so sorry about that. I think one of the, um, one of the takeaways was um, the, the learning that we had with the space around how to launch, um, you know, our film into a warm space. So how to do that preparatory work to make sure that when the the project landed you know people were already interested and anticipated and we weren't going from a standing start that was so valuable and something that we're going to repeat across all of our work um, I think that's one of our biggest takeaways and the second is that kind of um, you know that uh, there are um, there are 
there are skills that are transferable across uh, the different areas of our practice, you know, kind of as a, as a maker of live performance, um, I've always been slightly scared of working in film, quite frankly, but finding that actually it's, it's always about story. Um, it's just a different medium for telling stories has been, you know, so valuable and really exciting and made us hungry for the next project. Thank you. Thank you very much. And John, what, what about you? What do you think have been sort of real learnings for you? Well, certainly echoing kind of what Vicky said about kind of entering into like, well, into a warm kind of like space for that marketing. That is really key that I think it is kind of about trying to engage your communities um, and to let them kind of fly the flag for you. Kind of um, a big thing for us as well, which was so important was being able to really indulge in something that we are very passionate about and being able to kind of strip it back and tell that story in kind of just such a a clear and engaging way and allowing that space for it to breathe trusting in what it is like and a big message I, I guess I would say to everyone is that these are, it's quite a big thing to make a film kind of it can get quite oh we like you put all this energy into it and then the temptation is to to stop as soon as the film is done and actually that's when you have to really fire yourself up because you have worked so hard to make this beautiful incredible thing that that speaks of your work or resonates within the projects you're working with and it's just such a shame to then let that just disappear and that for us was a huge part of this process was we as we entered into the relationship with space we explicitly said we're very confident with the ability to make film because of our experience with it but what we want is to take this film to the next level to take it to new audiences to to push ourselves from a marketing perspective and that was the key for this project and so i just cannot reiterate enough that take the pride that you have in your work and give yourself put some extra fuel on that fire to keep pushing it and and that's where vicky is so right that a warm space then to welcome it at first will give you that oh my gosh this is exciting and you have to just keep going because people, you deserve to have that that film shown and seen and experienced by people who will then love and and cherish that or engage with it or kind of like, so yeah, that that for us was a massive thing was going, the film is complete and now our work it begins <laughs> almost to some extent, like. Yeah, that's really it, isn't it? You'd kind of think it isn't a case of just shoving it out there and hoping for the best. There's so much more that can be done. And um, I'm going to bring Sarah back in as well. But um, one of the things that we noticed was among, the audience for the webinar, there's lots of people in kind of digital and marketing roles. And Sarah and I were talking about, you know, in, in all of this sort of positioning, enticing, thinking about where your work goes. In your organisations, who is involved? Is it, does everybody in, in, in your, I'll, ask, I'll go to Vicky first maybe, but is everybody involved in this? idea of kind of putting the work out and creating context around it is it a digital marketing person's job is it a creative job how do you sort of how do you get people to work with you on it um, well we we're a tiny organization so everything is everybody's <laughs> job <laughs> frankly but no it, it was a collective effort you know we've got um a, a great team uh in the organization some involved in producing the thing and the artistic content of, of the film and some involved in kind of being in conversation and dialogue with uh, the, the us in the room making the film to understand what was happening and then kind of help distill that into a material. So Bridie and Camille and Sarah, who are working on the um, admin side of the team, um, had massive creative roles in helping us kind of realise how we were going to communicate what it was that we were making to a wider audience. Lovely, thank you. And, and John, what about with you? Who's, how did you, who do you need to draw upon to sort of market effectively and get your work out there? It's, it's a very similar case with us that we're a small, but I would say highly powerful and ambitious team, kind of like with an, uh, an amazing team, to be honest. Like, but for a large part of the early kind of iterations of, of Woven, I was helping lead on a lot of the, the marketing and social media from some of my background, but kind of as it has grown kind of like, it's needed more people to wade in and yeah there's kind of been a lot of brilliant people coming in with that but we were very lucky with with space that we we had some brilliant associates support us with that we do have some marketing agencies and people who kind of work 
freelance with our kind of and they work they uh, deliver ambitiously for our small budgets for it and we really uh we really value them but the key for us was we we don't necessarily have the budgets to have like a huge marketing team or to have a consistent marketing team so it was about us trying to to take the weight of what we could so that they could do what they do best and that was our big thing throughout this whole process is whenever we bring in someone who we know has marketing skills and ability it's about trying to free them up to not get bogged down with the, the small stuff that to, to allow them to really fly and i think that was what was a big success here was we were like okay we've got this person for x amount of days or we've got this person for this how do we ensure that you are focused on what you are best at doing and we can take the weight of that so it was very much about us all as a team coming in but also like I said celebrating people who could achieve stuff that we we couldn't have with our kind of skills thank you sarah is there anything that you'd want to add to to what the other two are saying no i just think um within like the creative industries everyone is really collaborative i find and it really helps like before I joined the space, I was an applicant um, from a from a theatre company. And I know that like, you know, when you're putting together those marketing plans, you really have to get feedback from every single person within the organisation because you don't want to leave any stone unturned and you never know what someone else is going to come up with. And I would say the same thing in terms of being open to feedback about the trailers and so on. like it's collaborative also people like to be involved um so it, yeah I, I would think like definitely don't treat it as this like siloed thing and also just thanks to both for shouting out the associates um because yeah they, they often they have these real specialisms and the good thing about that that network is they see the same problems or snags come up over and over again and so it's such a quick fix for an outside eye um so they are completely brilliant but it's that thing of like the the just asking okay if you, even if you don't have a space commission what might we be missing um and you never know you know what what like quick fix is around the corner yeah 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 um, and just sort of I'm going to ask you sort of one general question and then we'll we've got a moment where we ask people to fill in the evaluation forms and then we'll fi finish up. But any other, we've talked, you talked quite a lot about sort of planning, being really organized, giving yourself lots of time, talked about storyboarding. Any other, from anyone, just wave if you've got a thought, any other practical advice that you would like to pass on to any other people or organizations who might be doing something similar? So another thought, oh, go on, John. That's something I, I cannot reiterate enough is to be kind to yourself and amongst this journey like because I think within particularly within the creative sector we do take on so many additional roles to maybe what we should be we work long hours we we care deeply about our projects and sometimes like it can you don't know when to necessarily stop and it is important to really check in with your team to support each other to realize that yes you can push your ambitions but also to know that sometimes stuff can wait or like to like kind of and to appreciate that okay you might not have this yet but actually these are the successes because i think you can accidentally overwhelm yourself at points because you're trying to be like doing marketing advertising producing directing like and actually you're not necessarily an expert in all of that but all you can do is do your best with it and to try and enjoy it as well to really at the end of the day these projects are about celebrating important social issues like things that you care about and your own organization and what you your talent can achieve like so try and always remember that and try and find vigor in that and and like I said don't be afraid of sometimes going you know what i am exhausted i just need to take a break or talk to my teammates or just see what collaborators can help me with like that's that's a big key from me really thank you very much um Vicky, is there anything else that you would like to share? I guess um, just a, a really practical thing and one of the things that um, the Space Associates particularly Natalie reiterated to us was give yourself options because um, I guess the, the big difference for, for me, again, as, as a maker of live work was how much was dependent on the edit and being able to, in the edit, kind of rethink ideas and have enough footage to to to, to re-edit so that was that was an interesting one like give yourself options when you're filming capture as much as you can 
Plan A, Plan B, Plan C. Lovely. Thank you very much. And Sarah, is there any other thoughts that you want to share with anybody? Yeah, so I'd say like, um, actually, it's probably just building on what John said. So like, um, people do have to wear a lot of hats uh, in the organisation. And it's it's really crazy, like what we expect, not we, but like generally the sector expects people to know like all in one person um and I would say if there is something um just don't be afraid especially on like the one-off projects in um getting specialist support as a one-off like sometimes the things I send to our designer I mean she's just amazing I I would not be able to do it you know and it's like knowing where actually specialist support is really really useful and going that might actually save me a week and it's it's going to be one day of of her time um and just not like trying not to spread yourself too thin if you've got a bit of extra budget um yeah lovely I think you're echoing, really echoing what each other are saying there. So um, I'm going to stop now. We've got, um, uh, and then we'll, I'll just come back to do the thank yous right at the very end. But we have um, an evaluation form. It's really, really helpful to us. If you can take the two minutes it takes to fill in a very simple evaluation form, helps us to um, understand what we could do differently, what you've liked, um, and, and really to make the most of the webinar program. And then I'll just come back uh, a minute before the end to say thank you so much to our speakers before we before we disappear off. Yeah, so to so John and Vicky, you've not done this before, but we always do the evaluation in in the webinar time because it uh, uh, because I, I, I rather than ask me to stay on for a bit afterwards. So just and it wouldn't take me very long. So then I'll pop a thank you. That's fine. I feel like I should turn my camera around because there's there's a lot of action happening in front of me right now. <laughs> oh, I haven't got anyone's permission to do that, but it's it's a it's a new thing. There's a hand. <laughs> yeah, there's people flying around. It's 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 really fun. I have been amazed with your poise and ability to speak so eloquently and like <laughs> with everything going around around for you. It's quite amazing, Vicky. <laughs> Um, I think I'm going to bring I'll bring the webinar to an end because I don't think that that's what, can, we're really nearly out of time and people will know that they've got the evaluation so um, really the last thing to say is to thank th thank all of the um, attendees today for joining us and and especially and to Sarah for giving us some really good points at the beginning and to John and Vicky who have so generously shared their experience and their learning from because I think what's really important is now, having case studies and examples in real life, people having done things and tried it and being able to share, so, so valuable to everybody. So thank you very much to all of you for that. Um, and just to say that we our next webinar is coming up on the 7th of June, um, and we're looking at clearing digital rights. So that if you're interested in that, please do, please do join us for that. And I think and Angela's putting the information about our, our live uh, commissioning round which again John and Vicky have sort of explained really beautifully what what how so much support they've had from being commissioned by the space so that might be an inspiration to you all so thank you again very much and enjoy the rest of your day <laughs>